Cheers. Um, so yeah, I'm Harry. My talk's called Normalizing Design for Better Quality CSS. It's a real mouthful, I'm afraid. It's also got a second sort of title, Rationalizing Designs. They're really sort of subtly different, but quite significantly so. So the next sort of 40 minutes, I'm going to cover the kind of stuff I've done for the last two and a bit years in my day job, uh, which basically boils down to saying no to designers. Um, a lot of the time, as CSS developers, we spend building people's PSDs. Um, we may not have designed them ourselves, but we spend most of our time implementing them. And a lot of my time is spent actually not implementing stuff and telling designers, no, you can't have this. Um, as a result, I've kind of got a third title for this talk, which is uh, Why Designers Hate Me. Um, I think after working so closely with designers for quite a few years, they've stopped hating me quite as much, but um, it's still a real interesting dynamic I have with design teams. Because uh, I do push back on a lot of things that they want, and initially, when you, when you join a new team, when I joined my team, when I uh, was a, moved to Sky, uh, it was a really awkward kind of hurdle we had to get over, where I spent a lot of the time telling these really talented designers that I, look, I like what you've done, but you know, I can't build that, or we shouldn't build that. Um, the reason I've chosen to talk about this today is, um, as Nicole mentioned, uh, all the speakers who are here uh, weren't chosen, weren't asked to speak. We were, we, everyone submitted a proposal. And I really wanted to be here, so I submitted this because I thought it might be something that would generate a lot of discussion. It's potentially a bit controversial. Um, so yeah, I want to open some discussion up. Um, and if anyone wants to share anything uh, at all, I mean, we'll chat over lunch or over a beer. But in the meantime, if we put anything on Twitter, I'd love to see people's opinions on the kind of stuff I'm about to talk about. I know that a lot of people don't take too well to it, particularly designers. I don't know if there are any sort of designers in the, in the room. But um, yeah, I'd really like to open up discussion and see what everyone makes of the kind of stuff that, um, that I do and that I think people should do more of. Uh, and any disagreements I would really welcome because I, I want to hear sort of the, the opposite side of the coin. Um, so if anyone has heard of anything I've done before, it's probably through CSS Wizardry. Uh, which is a name I really hate now, um, but I'm stuck with that. Um, and I'm kind of, I, I've done lots of t uh, speaking, open source stuff, a lot of writing about sort of CSS architecture for the last few years. And uh, I'm at quite an exciting point at the moment, because I just kind of quit my day job, and I want to do CSS wizardry stuff full time. Uh, so, so, so taking this kind of idea of rationalizing designs and taking that to other companies. Um, so I'm currently in the process of leaving Sky. Now, I believe you've probably heard of Sky. You've heard of Sky over here, right? So it's a real big sort of UK sort of a multimedia sort of organization. Um, I've been there for two and a half years as a sort of a senior UI developer uh, and kind of the only UI developer. So I was plonked between a team of software engineers who are super clever at what they do and a, a bunch of designers who are really talented, really creative, really clever, smart guys. And I've sort of sat in between these two roles and acting like a, a bridge between engineering and design. And it's a really fun role to have. And it also means that I've had to deal a lot with, uh, with people and people's opinions and sort of keeping people happy. Um, the kind of work I've done at Sky has been fairly big sites, um, sites that take months and months to build, um, you know, heavily trafficked sites, uh, sites that have sort of dozens of engineers working on them. And the thing is with these sites, they start off fairly big, but they're only getting bigger. Um, there's one site that I built two and a half years ago, or started building two and a half years ago, and right now there'll be people in the office working on that site today. So it's a code base that's lasted two and a half years, and it's going to keep growing, and it's really important to, to be able to manage that. It's all well and good building a big website, but if you get lumbered with a badly built big website, you're going to have an unhappy team. So it's been my job at Sky to keep end, uh, front ends as small as I possibly can. Um, Anyone who works product, does anyone work product or in-house or for like a start or anything like that where you've got your own code base that you work with every day? Right, so quite a few of you actually. Um, could you imagine having to go to that job every day if the code base was a nightmare? Um, I, I've worked at places where that's the case. And if your day job, if every day you're working on code that you've grown to resent, that's not a nice place to be. Um, so I, my job to keep uh, code bases as small as possible, as, as sane as possible, but First and foremost, and most importantly, maintainable. Uh, one thing I learned quite early on at Sky was the easiest way to keep a code base maintainable is just to keep it small. Uh, it stands to reason that the smaller your code base is, the less problems you'll have, you know, less things are out to go wrong. Statistically, less can go wrong because there's less of it. Um, the less you have to look after. Just keeping things small is the simplest single way to keep something maintainable. 
And the easiest way to keep it small is to just write less stuff. And this is where I come back to telling designers no. I think it's really important, even if you've got a, uh, a business-led decision, that we as developers, designers, programmers, still sort of dig our feet in if we think something's a bad idea, we dig our heels in and say no to things. Um, a lot of the time I've spent at Sky has been saying no to design features, design treatments that I think might look nice, but won't really benefit the code base. What we've got to remember is that we're delivering websites, and websites are built on code. Uh, we're not delivering designs, we're not delivering print stuff, we're not delivering PSDs. Uh, that's part of the process. What we're giving users is code bases. Um, you know, the users don't know that, they don't need to know about the code behind it, but that's what we're building, and we need to take care of that first and foremost. Uh, it's really important that I fire a quick disclaimer in here, though, because I'm going to talk sort of for the rest of this, for the rest of this talk um, a little like it's me versus them, and I really don't want that, that to come across. Um, I don't want to sound like I'm patronizing designers. I don't want to sound like I'm looking down on them. Uh, it's certainly not the case. So this talk isn't anti-design. This talk is about keeping designers and developers and the business and users happy. Um, I've got a really good professional uh, working relationship with my design team, the design team at Sky. Um, they do some fantastic work. They're very clever guys, and we've got a mutual respect. Uh, so this talk isn't anti-design. I'm not saying design's a bad thing at all. Uh, another thing to note is this, the kind of stuff I'm talking about it won't work on every site and, and probably shouldn't. Um, the kind of sites I'm talking about are, are bigger websites, which I refer to as sort of a UI-based. If you think about the Facebooks, the Google Pluses, um, apps that people keep returning to, uh, that people spend a long time on, things that are inherently big but need to be consistent. Uh, this kind of stuff wouldn't be really appropriate for um, a photographer's portfolio or a single-page marketing site. Um, so yeah, um, the stuff I'm about to talk about might not be appropriate for the kind of stuff you're working on or, um, or the kind of projects you might have worked on previously. And you might just disagree with me. Like I said, um, and we've got the hashtag, if you do just think I'm talking absolute rubbish, I'd love to know because um, I've worked fairly sort of solo for the last two and a half years. And this is something I found has really worked for me. And um, I've never had opposition from other developers because there haven't been any. Uh, I've had opposition from designers. So I'd really like to get your opinions if you have any. Um, yeah, if you disagree, I'd love to know why or, or what potential other ways of working that you, you guys sort of work too. Um, a lot of the stuff I've done with Sky has been based around making compromises. Now, compromise is a really negative-sounding word. People think of it as a bad thing. But compromise is actually really, really good. Because what compromise does is it keeps more than one person happy. Compromise is like the opposite of selfish. Uh, it's been really important for me that I've established a good working relationship and personal sort of friendships with, uh, with the design team. We have massive respect for one another's jobs. I know that I need to get out of their way and let them do their thing, but they now understand that I'm a developer. I think differently to how uh, a subjective and creative person would think. I have to think very objectively. Um, one thing that's really important is I never just say no. So I kind of made it sound like I do, but I always discuss everything that I'm thinking, everything I want to do, and I explain why. This is really important um, for two reasons. It allows this collaboration to happen. It allows them to fire back their opinions. Um, um, but it also allows them to understand why I think how I do, and it allows them to start thinking that way as well. So not only does it open up the discussion for alternatives, it allows them to preempt the kind of things that I would see as sticking points. Uh, yet we collaborate to reach ideals. Now, um, Sky, and, and I'm aware that several larger companies still do, have quite a slow-moving process. And that's probably a business rather than a dev problem. Um, you know, the business want to see PSDs, so we get those, and then we take them into the browser and we build them. Bigger companies, um, people don't talk about it often enough, but bigger companies do move a lot slower, and it's harder to have a complete design in the browser culture. And we don't have one at Sky. Uh, what we have is um, a phrase that someone coined recently, and I can't remember who it was, um, decide in the browser. I don't know if you've heard that, if anyone knows who who came up with that. If you could tweet that at me, it would be brilliant. I'd love to attribute them. We decide in the browser, and I do that alongside designers. Because a PSD, for all it might look nice, you've got no idea how or if that can work in real life. So we have this process where, yeah, they'll come to me with a Photoshop file, and I'll start building, and I'll say, well, hey, look, look at this. I don't think this is very good because you know, it's a bit hacky, so what can we change? So we decide in the browser. Uh, but importantly, no means no. Um, if a designer says to me, 
look, no, you're not changing this. We have to have this. Um, I will argue my case, and I'll discuss why I think it's a bad idea. But their opinions are just as valid as mine. And if they're adamant that they want something to stay in, want something to, to remain as is, um, I will respect that. And you know, no means no. If they don't want me to change something, then, uh, then there are some times when I won't. Uh, a lot of the discussions I have with designers at Sky are based a lot around sort of like cheesy one-liners. Um, I'm a sucker for a sound bite. Um, this is something I put in an article a few years ago. Um, I can't remember which article it was, but people still quote me on this. Um, a PSD is a clue and not a contract. Um, so yeah, a designer will come to me with a PSD, um, but there's no guarantee that I'm going to build exactly what they've put down. Um, people see it as this contractual obligation. This is the Photoshop file, therefore this is what we're going to do. Uh, and that's a really bad way of thinking. It's a very stubborn way of thinking, and it's very... Uh, very detrimental to the entire process. Because if you draw a line at PSD stage, you've got the entire rest of the project where you're stuck with a decision that you made far too early on. Uh, like, I, like I said, we need to decide in the browser. It's far too early on to commit to anything when it's just pixels uh, in Photoshop. Um, what a PSD will do is, this is the clue aspect, gives me an idea of what the designer wants. It gives me an idea of the kind of feel they want the site to have. It'll tell me what brand treatments, what colors are used. Um, you know, what kind of turn the page will set. Um, it can give you a really good steer, and it might be a very complete and very polished PSD. It might look like, a, it, might look like it could be a complete design. Um, but you should see it as no more than clues and, uh, and kind of, uh, yes, yeah, steers and, and pointers to where the design should be headed. Uh, Andy Clark calls it the design atmosphere, which I think is a really, really nice term. Um, it's not the design, it's how the design feels. And you can glean a lot from a PSD um, just, just um, in terms of the design atmosphere. Take it as clues and hints as to what the designer wants, not as a gospel uh, agreement as to what they shall get. Another thing I find myself saying to the team a lot is, um, it's doable, but you know, I won't, or it's doable, but I don't want to, or I shouldn't. Uh, we find that we can build almost anything. We're all good developers, um, and there, are, there aren't many problems we come across that we can't, you know, we can't build something. Um, but it doesn't mean that we should. Just because we can find a solution doesn't mean that we always should use it. I used to really pride myself on writing reams and reams of CSS to build crazy designs that someone had come up with. Uh, have you ever got a PSD off a print designer? Right? I used to get really proud when I was like, oh, I could build that. And I'd have like, a style sheet this long to build one header. And I used to really love that. I used to think, oh, I'm so good at my job. Look, I've made this look exactly like the PSD. And I soon well, actually, it wasn't even that soon. I'll admit it was years before I realized that this was very, very naive. Uh, this is a very silly way of working because there's so much more to building a front end than just replicating a PSD. Um, you shouldn't ever write code that's terrible just to satisfy a design that could have been changed. Like I said, we're, we're building products that are based on code. We should never have code suffer for the sake of something superficial, um, especially when you're working on a product that you look after for several years. The code base is what you work with day in, day out don't sort of sacrifice the quality of that code base for something that could have been avoided. Uh, it kind of leads me on to um, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I've spelt doesn't wrong. That's embarrassing. Um, so um, this pearl of wisdom is from Jurassic Park, of all films. Right? The, the bit.ly URL uh, is a scene in Jurassic Park where they're discussing the fact that, sure, we can bring dinosaurs back, but is that a good idea? Should we do it? It's actually a really good scene. It's quite a metaphor for a lot of other things. And in their case, bringing dinosaurs back wasn't too wise. Um, so yeah, just because I can, or because you can, doesn't always mean you should. Um, avoid problems. Don't try and just show off and write complex, convoluted code just to satisfy a design team. Think about the, um, the end user. Can you write something that's fast? Um, satisfy other developers. Make sure they don't inherit your code and they just sort of look at it blank faced, wondering why on earth you did something. Uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Performance is a really big thing for me. And I tend to say this to designers quite a lot at Sky. Um, they're really into sort of um, you know, retina stuff. Retina looks real nice, and you always notice a non-retina experience. But it's a performance overhead. It's a hit to your site speed. Um, you know, you've always got to think about things a little wider than, well, it looks nice. It doesn't matter how nice it looks. If it takes 20 seconds to get onto someone's device, uh, it's kind of a, a misguided effort. Um, users do love and appreciate good design. Um, they interact more with beautifully designed things. Nicely designed things are typically easier to use. 
Uh, if you work on a product or an app that you want people to engage with and use over and over again, a nice UI is very important. But studies have shown time and time again that users will leave before they even get to see that UI. If your site is slow, they won't stay around to see how nice you've designed it. They will disappear. So you've got to think about how fast you can get something that looks almost as good onto that user's device. Um, it's something I, I, I like to work to um, performance first. Um, stuff like mobile first and content first are really good, noble sort of uh, schools of thought. But I, I like to go back even further and start performance first, because performance first will benefit everyone. It doesn't matter if you're on a, a fiber connection on a brand new shiny MacBook, or you're going through a train tunnel on a, on a Blackberry. Performance first will benefit everyone. And this is something we've moved towards at Sky. Uh, I'm really proud of the designers there. We've done some great work together. We've sort of managed to form this good working relationship where um, I had a designer come to me a couple of weeks ago, and he's like, oh, Harry, I've, I've designed this, but I was thinking if we get rid of that, we can save a couple of requests. And I was like, that's really cool to have a designer, because we've got a very traditional split. We have designers, me, and engineers. Um, so we still have a very tiered approach. But the fact that I'm getting designers to think about HTTP requests while they're tinkering in Photoshop, that's really good news for the product. It's really good news for the code base, and it's really good news for the team. Um, so I've kind of got our designers thinking performance first. Everything they design uh, will have a performance impact, and how can we mitigate and, and lessen that? Uh, something I will readily admit I completely made up um, is the 80-20 rule. Again, these are all conversations I have with the design team at Sky, um, and any designers I work with, typically. The 80-20 rule loosely sort of say, states that um, if we can achieve 80% of a design in 20% of the code, then we should always take that option. Um, yeah, if, if, pick some really easy numbers. Um, if we've got a design and it would take 100 lines to code it perfectly, to get 100% of that design, it would take 100 lines of code. If I could build 80% of that design, something that's almost the same, in 20 lines of code, I will pick that one every time. Because, like I said before, the easiest way to keep a code base maintainable is to keep it small. The easiest way to keep it small is just to trim things out. Anything superficial, anything that doesn't really, really matter, if we can get rid of it, then we're going we're gonna to start seeing benefits across the board. If you scale this way of thinking across a site that's two and a half years old, and you trim everything you can for two and a half years, the amount of savings are huge. Um, all these things sound like micro-optimizations. I've got a friend called Jamie Mason, uh, a fantastic JavaScript engineer, and he says, uh, if you look after the bits, the bytes will look after themselves. So a lot of micro-optimizations will add up to, a, over a project that spans years, they all add up to sizable savings. Uh, this is something that designers actually say to me. Um, my boss is a lovely guy. I met him five years ago. We worked at an agency um, together five years ago. Rob Farnell, really clever guy. Um, but we've got such a friendship that he kind of really takes the piss out of me at work. And he tells me this all the time. If I say to him, oh, I'm not building that, he'll say, like, well, I thought you could. Can you, are you not up to it? Can you not do this? And it really annoys me. I know he's, I know he's winding me up. Um, but it's kind of the same thing as before. Just because I can doesn't mean I should. Um, but telling a team of designers that I won't build something often makes me look like a bad developer. Um, they often question why I'm employed. Why am I there to do this job when they know that they could build it? Um, but again, it's, there's so much more to being a front-end developer than just pixel-perfect matching PSDs. Um, a front-end developer has to think about uh, the quality of a code base, the, uh, the product as a whole, and the rest of the team. Um, you'd never judge um, a builder's ability um, or his worth on his ability to lay bricks, because that's looking far too, far too um, sort of fine. Um, you judge a builder's abilities um, on how well he can create a, a big, strong structure that will last for hundreds of years. Uh, to measure a front-end developer's worth on his or her ability to, um, to match designs in the browser is a really sort of naive and close-minded way of looking at things. Uh, there's far much more to it than that. Uh, so you've got to look at the bigger picture. That's why you know, we, we think performance first. That's why we think about how we can scale this website, how we can uh, keep it maintainable, how we can keep it nice to work with. Um, I can guarantee that if my day job was just seeing how well I could match designs, uh, this site that's two and a half years old, we'd want to scrap that by now. And two and a half years isn't even a long time. And this site's going to go on indefinitely. It could end up being five years old. Um, and you know, five years' worth of um, just matching PSDs pixel for pixel would lead to a terribly uh, complex, convoluted, and nasty code base. 
one thing I've noticed, particularly among my sort of engineering friends, people far cleverer than I am, is the better you get at writing code, the less you want to write. Um, so I, it's, it's happened to me. I used to love writing tons of CSS to perfectly replicate a PSD. But the better I've got at my job, uh, the more I've learned, uh, the more I've realized that I don't want to write any more code. I own a code base that I don't want to get any bigger. I want to do everything I can to keep it small, to keep it nice to, uh, to work with. Uh, I've got to the point where I, I resent writing any code that I feel I could have avoided. Um, any time I write something sort of bespoke that I know will never get reused, it's kind of a hit. And it's going to happen, of course it's going to happen. Uh, you couldn't have two page headers. Um, you know, there's certain things you will only have one of. But I hate having to write anything bespoke, because anything bespoke is like a, it's like a, it's dead weight. And like I said, it will happen, but avoid it at all costs. Um, I always like to recycle things. If I see anything that I think I could have uh, borrowed from elsewhere, but I, I've missed the opportunity, um, that's time to go back and refactor. Um, it's, some people sort of accuse me of, uh, sort of premature abstraction, uh, which is kind of fair. I, can, I see the point. There's like a rule of thumb, um, don't abstract until you've used something two times. Um, I, I don't do that. I'll cover this in a second. Um, but I always try and write everything to be reusable from the outset, because anything you can reuse is free of charge. And free of charge is a really important thing in growing a code base. Free of charge means it already exists, but it costs you nothing to use it again. Uh, anything you can get free of charge is really, really nice. Uh, it's a nice thing for a code base to have. Um, the way to write less code, two of the simplest ways, are to normalize and abstract. These are two, two, um, two computer science terms. Normalization usually deals with data sets and, and trimming down repetition in those. And abstraction deals with um, sort of taking design patterns uh, and, and putting them elsewhere in like a reusable decoupled state. Uh, so normalization, um, it's about spotting repetition. Um, so uh, Nicole uh, gave a really good talk, uh, it's quite a while ago now, I imagine, uh, called Our CSS Best Practices Are Killing Us. And, uh, and this dealt a lot with normalization and, and the idea that if there's a lot of things repeated across a design, then they should be sort of gathered together. Spotting repetition is a really useful skill to have because uh, it allows you to gather these things up and normalize them. Uh, but more important than that is spotting the potential for repetition. So someone might have used um, you know, the same uh, color in 10 different places. You can abstract that out. But what if they've used similar colors in 10 different places? Can we distill that down into just one? And this is things that are, these are things that Nicole's dealt with quite uh, in depth. Um, so if we take this example, um, we've got a header, footer, and a content div. Uh, they've all got really similar padding values. Um, they're only two pixels apart. Will the user notice that the footer's uh, two pixels smaller than the header? I don't think they will. Uh, so why, why have that departure? Can we distill this down into just one number? Can we make them all 20 pixels? And I'm pretty sure we can. Um, so this is normalization, and this is a really timid example. Um, if, you, if you take this school of thought and apply it to a full front end, you will find lots of uh, potential for repetition that you can normalize out. Uh, so normalization is the start, but the next thing we need to do is abstract this. Uh, we need to take these things and wrap them up. Uh, we need to decouple them from their initial purposes, their initial use cases. Um, we take these normalizations, put them in little bundles that we can reuse anywhere that are completely agnostic um, to the DOM or to whatever they were initially spawned from. So um, if we look at this, we've now normalized this design pattern. We've, we've shared that. 20 pixels across these three things, but it's still very tightly coupled. We can't reuse that anywhere else without adding another selector to that list. Um, so we, we've kind of got halfway there. We've normalized this really simple design pattern, but now we need to put it to work. Now we need to abstract it. Uh, the first thing we'll do is pop it in a variable, and of course, using SAS because, well, there's no other alternative as far as I'm concerned. Um, let's not start a, a war about that one on Twitter, though, please. Uh, so yeah. Just pop in something in a variable. Um, Preprocessors are really good at helping you um, use abstractions. They're built for that very purpose, to avoid you repeating things. So the simplest single step we can take is just dropping this 20 pixels into a variable. Uh, take that a step further, we can drop it into abstracted classes. So we have a class of box. This doesn't tie itself to any type of content. This is, this is now a free thing to reuse. This is an abstraction that we can place wherever we want. Uh, we can use a solid class and drop it into markup, which is my preferred way of working. 
Um, but you know, if, if you don't like that, then we can use the um, we can use the silent class and use extend. Uh, this is a way of taking those normalizations and now moving them completely away from where we originally found them into something totally reusable. Um, it's all decoupled, and now it comes free of charge. And uh, you know, these are really timid examples. These are just well, they are just that examples. You can spot these yourselves, and, uh, and we can put these to work for us. Um, so this is a real simple uh, use case, but there are hundreds, well, infinite amounts more that you can spot for yourselves. And it's doing stuff like this that's managed to keep code bases where I've worked um, nice and small. So I mentioned that I sort of get accused of premature abstraction. Um, I'll make sure I got the right word there. Um, so like I mentioned before, a lot of people will say, don't abstract something until you've used it twice. Uh, so a lot of the engineers at Sky have um, sprints where they've just got refactoring work to do. And I hate refactoring. I think it's so dull. Um, so what I do is I, I abstract everything up front. Everything I write, I like to think is going to be reusable. It may never get reused, but for the sake of it, why not just do the job properly the first time round? Um, so whenever I get accused of premature abstraction, I kind of prefer to call it prepared abstraction. Uh, if you're going to spend uh, a complete sprint refactoring your code, well, I'll just, I'll just do my own thing and, and not have that sort of boring stuff to do, because I've already done my job um, as well as I can from the outset. Um, doing it that way from the outset does mean that there will be things that will never get reused. So there is, some sort of, there is a hit up front that um, if, like me, you don't enjoy refactoring code, then this is probably the best way to go. Um, another sort of cheesy sound bite I use with, uh, with designers is that they're called rule sets for a reason. And again, this isn't really true. Um, it's just like a metaphor. Uh, so designers will come up with really sort of subjective and, and nice looking creative designs um, f with free reign. I believe that you, know, you shouldn't bog designers down too much with uh, overhead and, and um, sort of constraints, because that will limit what they can do. Um, so what I like to do at Sky is so like, design what you think is the best solution and then we'll work together to flesh that out into a, a proper production solution. So what I said to them is, they're called rule sets for a reason. So what I do is, um, whatever you've designed, I now as a developer, with my sort of developer hat on, I have to distill down into rules. Um, but the, the good thing there is, um, consistent user interfaces are all based around rules anyway. Um, you know, um, and I, I, sort of, I mentioned sort of sites like uh, Facebook and Google+. Plus. Uh, these are big sites you want users to interact with for, for long amounts of time. If everything's consistent, it kind of gives them a little more faith in that product, in that site. Um, they can trust it more because they know what to expect. So a good, consistent user interface is based around rules anyway. So if we can take these subjective designs and distill those down into rules that we stick to, um, the code base is going to stay a lot smaller. Um, it's going to be easier to manage, but also the user gets a better experience. The user can have more faith in a product or service because it always res uh, responds and looks and behaves the same. This is something I actually drew um, about two or three weeks ago in a meeting, and I thought I'd snap a photo for this talk. Uh, Rob, the guy who I mentioned earlier who takes the mick out of me, um, we were discussing a component. Um, and I can't remember which one it was. It, I think it was just uh, any generic component. We're building a component library at Sky. And, and the middle line you see the, that comes sort of straight out, the straight line that has enough, um, you know, that is the, the longest one, that is the ideal lifespan of a component that you don't touch. If you don't touch that, if you stick to the rules, that is its happy little lifespan and nothing ever changes. You don't have to worry about anything. Um, but any departure from that becomes a fork in the curd. So um, let's say we've got a component, and on one page it needs to be a little bigger. Instantly, that's a fork in the code. Um, on another page, or for whatever reason, you might want to um, you know, have a different font. I don't know why you'd do that, but um, you know, that could be the case. Or there might be an error state in which you know, it, it becomes red. Um, all these modifications, all these variations of a component are extra commitments. Every sort of a breakage of any rule is a commitment. Um, what if we change? Um, the, the topmost version, how will that impact anything else? Because CSS um, inherits and shares so much, uh, we have to know that if we change one thing, we need to know how it will affect any of the uh, six or seven others. Every fork in the code is more overhead. And the more you can reduce those forks, the better. Of course, if something does need to be read in an error state, then we can live with that. We can have one fork. 
that every single thought that tries to be introduced, every kind of rule that anyone wants to break needs to be really carefully considered. Um, I think if you're going to come up with rules, uh, cause of all the problem we've had previously is uh, we come up with rules and the business would be like, oh, can we have this button a little bigger? It's like, well, you can, it's really easy to do, but now we've got to have one different type of button just to satisfy that request. Is that really worth it? And it's, it's a really interesting place to be when you have to sort of tell designers they can't have this and tell the business they can't have that, and you're in the middle of it all. I mean, it all comes back to this sort of sorting out your relationships with the people you work with. Um, and, and rules are a really, really nice way to get people to agree to things up front. Uh, and like I said, I will break rules if I need to, if it's a really valid reason. Um, we can work to that, and we can work around that. Um, so I've got, some, I've got some quick examples. Now, um, when I submitted the proposal for this talk, uh, I was like, that sounds quite interesting. And then about 10 minutes later, I was like, oh, how am I going to write like a 40-minute talk out of this? Um, and then I started writing it, and I realized it was like a, this, this should be like a half-day workshop. Um, so I'm going to blitz through some stuff fairly quickly. Um, so I've tried to have this as more of a theoretical talk than a heavy sort of code-led talk. Um, one of my favorite UI and design-based rules, one that I would share happily with everyone, and I would recommend to everyone, um, is, is a rule that you can set when the first sort of four lines of your new project. Um, any new project you start, you'll probably do something like this you will decide on the base font size and the base line height. This is a real fundamental decision. Now, hopefully, you'd write it a little more like this. Um, but what it all comes down to is the fact that you've chosen a base font size of 16 pixels and a base line height of 24 pixels. Uh, that 24 is a very, very important number. Um, the first decision you make about a build can underpin the, the, sort of the sizing and the, the build of your entire project. That 24 pixels now becomes our base spacing unit. And this is something I've done on every single site I've built, every single site I've built for the last two and a bit years, and it's never let me down yet. So I'm really quite confident about this and, and how it works. Um, this underpins the uh, skybet.com, the site that I keep referencing that, that took sort of two and a half years. Um, so I've put this into practice, and it's really worked quite nicely. Um, our base spacing unit. So I'm probably uh, fairly confident you've all seen code like this before. Um, and initially, nothing looks too, too bad with that. But I, I cringe when I see code like this because, well, 38 pixels is a really specific number to be on such a loose selector. Why, why 38? Where's that come from? Um, a code base that you can't rationalize, that you can't trust, um, is, is bad news because I see that there's 38 pixels, um, a margin on that H1. I don't touch that. That number sounds so specific that there must be a reason for it somewhere. So I won't change that, and most developers won't. So you'll add another class, and you'll uh, add more code to try and get around this 38 that's inexplicable. Um, this isn't very sane code. This is hard to rationalize. It's hard to make sense of. And if you get this in a big code base, uh, it becomes really hard to work with. Um, so my solution, the, the base spacing unit, is give every block level element the same initial margin bottom. Um, the link at the bottom there is, uh, that I'm covering is um, to an article I wrote about this. Um, this base spacing unit can be used to sort out your entire site spacing. Uh, and the nice thing is, because 24 pixels is our base line height, uh, as soon as we apply that as the margin bottom, we get perfect vertical rhythm for free. So we get a nice reading experience completely for free here. Um, and this is, this is like a, a rational, sane number that has a reason behind it, applied to very loose selectors. Now, if we want our page title to be um, double that, we can do that quite easily. That's a rule we can break, because we can rationalize where that number came from in the first place. Um, but it's not about margin bottoms, either. So I wrote uh, an article called The Island Object, which is basically just a, a more abstract way of thinking about a box. So now we pad that island object by 24 pixels. That number has a purpose. We know where it came from because it underpins our entire UI. Um, but if we want a smaller box, an islet, for example, um, we can just halve that number, which leads us on to the next thing, a really nice rule. That, um, I haven't managed to write this up yet. I just haven't had the time. I really want to write an article on this um, called UI Sizing Scales. So we've got this 24 pixels that underpins our, our main sort of spacing. Um, so we can do things like this. We can spin off any variations of a component that we, we might need uh, just by having this BEM-inspired naming convention. Um, you know, we can halve things, we can double them, we can quadruple them. So, um, for example, yeah, here we've got the 24 pixels again, but the tiny version is 6 pixels. 
And these are rules that we can stick to. We can rationalize all these numbers. If a designer wants to make a button a bit smaller, we can do that. We can use the tiny modifier. Um, and these are all based around simple rules that we actually set up in the first decision uh, we made. The first decision we made about this build uh, can underpin the entire UI. Now, the reason designers dislike me is this is a very, very methodological, uh, methyl I won't try and say that word. It's a very um, sort, of, um, sort of clinical approach to, uh, to design. It's hard to tell a designer that I'm going to distill your design down to numbers. Um, it's a really hard thing to get across to them that, well, you might have designed this because it looked right, but I want to change it because the numbers work, and I can trust these numbers now. And, and it doesn't always work. It doesn't always work correctly. Um, and, you know, they don't always appreciate that. And it's something that I have to sort of, I have to live with. But if we can distill things in code down to numbers and rules, um, we can have much more confidence in growing a code base because we know what to spin out from where. Um, so typography is another really, um, a really sort of important thing here. Um, again, this is kind of a piggybacking the work that Nicole's been doing, uh, or has done. Um, so we've got our 16-pixel uh, base font size, and all of a sudden we've got a read more link that's one pixel smaller than that, and we've got a caption that's one pixel larger. Uh, here we've got scope for normalization. Why have we got this slight departure? Users probably won't notice that one pixel difference, so why even have it in the first place? Um, we can piggyback HTML elements. We've already got HHS one through t uh, yeah, headings one to six, um, and body copy and small print. That's already eight different sizes of font out of the box. We shouldn't really add to that. If we can avoid adding to that um, uh, unnecessarily, then we really should. Um, so your body copy is your default. I always really get sort of concerned when I see people setting font sizes on paragraphs or on lists, because if you set that high up, if you set that on the HTML element, that will trickle down anyway. Uh, and again, this is just micro-optimization to cut bits out of a code base. You shouldn't need a font size on a paragraph, because that should be governed by something that's happened way further up the DOM. Um, so body copy is the default. The thing you put on the HTML element, the, the font size you give, that should trickle down to everything. And headings and small print are the kind of exceptions. And there will be other exceptions. You might want a big call to action that needs to be huge. Um, um, you, know, you, can, you can bend the rules, but if you stick to as many as you can, you're going to find you've got a much more rational and sane code base. Um, you know, so this is, this is how it kind of looks. You could sort out, if you were to do a blog, for example, um, just a real text-heavy site that was mainly for reading, that should be your entire site's typography sorted. You shouldn't really need any more than that. Um, but if you do, uh, this is something, again, from Nicole, um, sort of a double-stranded heading hierarchy. We can normalize and abstract any other font sizes we need into this kind of thing, so we can cross over a H4 that looks like a H1. And this is all part of normalizing and rationalizing and abstracting designs uh, for the sake of our code quality. Uh, I've got some real quick, real-life examples then, uh, real quick. Um, so the last site I built was m.skybet.com. It's a mobile-specific site for uh, uh, Sky's biggest and most profitable online property. A really cool project to work on. Uh, we had this. Now, I was concerned about this. I don't know if you can see this, this blue grid of nine icons. Can you see like the blue divider lines that split the icons apart from each other? I've kind of pulled it out into this um, a little more stark example. So the designer said, well, between each icon, we want this grid. And this grid has to fade out from dark blue to light blue. Now, we could probably build this. Um, you know, we could use some pseudo elements and CSS gradients, or we could have used images, um, like background images, but that, that's extra requests. Or we could have base 64 of those images, but that's kilobytes of extra CSS just for the sake of these really trivial, simple-looking design treatments. Um, so what I did is I went back and said, well, look, why don't we cheat? Why don't we use illusion? So now instead of gradiating the borders out, we put a real subtle gradient on the container, the nav container. Um, and now those borders are solid colors. Now we can use one pixel solid whatever um, and give the illusion that these borders sort of fade out to nothing. And they don't at all. It's the background that fades. But we've managed to save tons of CSS and using um, just a single one-line border rules uh, to replace that entire thing. So if we switch back to this, um, I really don't think you'll be able to see it, but the horse racing bit, that's the lighter part of the nav, and the edges are what gets darker. And all of those borders are just solid one-pixel CSS borders. Nothing tricky, nothing complicated. The trick is to cheat uh, and use illusion. There are clever, sneaky things you can do. Um, 
yeah, I'm going to have to really blitz through these, I'm afraid. Uh, another really simple example was, um, you can see we had this nav, and again, it's this sort of gradiated border, a really simple design treatment, something that we could all build. Um, but again, how would we build it? It's the same story. We could use a background image or base 64 or CSS gradients and pseudo elements. Um, but that seems like a lot of stuff to have to do just to satisfy this one tiny design treatment. I would hate to have to use 10 lines of CSS gradient to get one border between two list items. It seems really over the top. And if you scale that across an entire site, the amount of extra code you're stuffing in there just to make simple things happen, it seems really sort of, it seems really backward. Um, so in this time, I didn't use illusion. I just changed the design completely. Instead of having gradiated borders, um, we did this kind of a tr effect. I'm sure you've seen this where you, you put two sort of similar colored borders, and it creates like a bevel effect. Um, so now the nav looks entirely different to what it was designed as, but it still looks good. The user won't miss that. But it's the 80-20 rule. We've got something similar. We've got a divider in there. But now it takes one border left and one border right property. That's all it took to build that instead of pseudo elements and 10 lines of prefixed CSS gradients. Um, so the kind of moral is if, if something seems unreasonably difficult to build, then don't build it. If you look at something trivially sort of a, quite, quite a simple treatment uh, and you think it feels a bit hacky, then stop. Um, seek alternatives and rationalize and normalize and alter the designs. Don't write bad code just to keep a design team happy. Um, the code base is what you have to look after first and foremost. Um, you know, speak to the designers about it. Don't just go and do it. Um, but rationalize and pair things back and really, uh, and really change designs to, uh, to sort of suit the code quality. Um, take the easy route. I kind of, I'm very unashamed with the fact that I'm a lazy developer. Um, and everyone should be. There's no point causing yourself work, showing off, doing convoluted, over-the-top things uh, for the sake of, you know, sh like, you know um, for keeping designers happy. Uh, keep everything as simple as possible. Um, so yeah, m.skybet.com, the last sort of examples I showed you. This is the most brutal I've ever gone with sort of rationalizing designs. I worked very closely with a designer at Sky, and it was fantastic. It was such a good experience for, for the both of us. Um, it's the most pared back design we have ever built. It's the most brutal, uh, pushed back thing I've ever worked on. Uh, it looks fantastic. All the users love it. We get lots of great feedback. But the best feedback we get every single time is how fast this site is. Uh, we've got a suite of performance engineers who work on the tech stack, but uh, I'm the front end performance guy. And I get great pride out of thinking that me and the designers have built a site where the users can't wait to tell us how fast it is. We constantly get told that we are faster than all our competitors, and it's all down to sort of rationalizing and normalizing these designs uh, just to keep code bases tiny. Uh, really, I'm going to have to rush through this now then. Um, See, we don't deliver designs. Users don't interact with PSDs. They interact with websites. So the code quality should become uh, our, our foremost concern. Um, make compromises um, for the sake of the build quality. Discuss things with your team and, uh, and really work on the best solution to deliver a product rather than a design. Um, stick to as many rules as you can and just be lazy and cheat. Uh, and that's me with one minute left. So I'll, uh, I'll thank you all for listening. Um, yeah, thank you very much.